years hunter. Well, thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here and to share some of this work. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of names here because it takes a village. And um, um, I just want to acknowledge my colleagues at U of M, uh, the Cooperative Institute for Great Lakes Research, also in the School of Natural Resources at U of M, and then the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab and my colleagues there. Um, this work, let's see here. Here we go. Really um, was spawned out of uh, some observations about the the invasive mussels that have established themselves and had some what appear to be some some large uh, cast a large shadow. Um, they can graze on a variety of aquatic organisms, and this has been documented. Um, but what really caught, I think, people's interest here in the Great Lakes um, were recent water quality changes, we might say, that kind of coincided with the establishment of mussels, both in the western basin of Lake Erie and in Saginaw Bay. So while we all acknowledge that nutrient loads and uh, changing climate uh, can affect um, the growth of, of plankton and particularly plankton that may uh, be uh, potentially harmful, the muscles seem to play a role in this. And so that's the angle that we were interested in understanding and quantifying if we can. So we did uh, build on some grazing experiments that found high clearance rates of uh, muscles on a variety of plankton, but mainly on plankton in this nanoplankton size range. So we wanted to drill down and actually look at how, what are the potential influences that that might have on the blooms that now seem to be so prevalent. So if you look off to the right, you'll see a recent um, um, satellite um, photograph there of these relatively massive blooms that back in, I think, 2017 or 18, uh, closed down um, the uh, Toledo water uh, intake. They were so massive. So where we were thinking that we're doing a good job here in managing the watershed and minimizing loads to this part of the, the Great Lakes system, um, we've now seen um, a proliferation of harmful algae. So what we wanted to do was take um, kind of a holistic approach, if we could, by looking at a variety of different types of technologies to monitor what went on in our experiments. And our hypothesis is, in a sense, that sustained muscle grazing, and particularly its preference on smaller sized protists, might actually enhance um, the um, occurrence and the proliferation of things like microcystis. Here's a diagram that we adapted from some uh, work by Fenchel uh, that lays out a schematic of the Great Lakes food web kind of in cartoon. And the thing that's unique and interesting is these critters up here that have now uh, become uh, successful invasives, particularly uh, two or, or, or so species of Dracaenid mussels and, and more recently the quagga and bithotrephes. What we wanted to do was to look at the effect that the mussels have because they're capable of grazing and handling such a range of potential prey. We wanted to look at, if we could, to census what was happening in the entire lower food web during these experiments. So I'm gonna just take you through some of the players and a little bit of what we know about them um, in a con in, in by way of concept. But we're gonna kind of work our way from the little picos, which kind of range in size from 0.2 to two in you know cell dimension up to the nanoplankton, 2 to 20, and the microplankton, 20 to 200 microns in size. 
So most of the organisms I'm going to talk about today are really not visible with the naked eye unless they grow in such high density that they become uh, conspicuous. So heterotrophic and phototrophic picoplankton. And again, that's how this is set up. We've got phototrophs here, heterotrophs here on this kind of side. And we've got predators that can graze on both, you know, that can um, graze on both uh, um, phototrophs and heterotrophs. And some of that hasn't really been ferreted out to a great extent. So this is a micrograph of a, of a 0.2 filter with the collections that have been made on top. And you'll see there are some things in here that are quite unique and some things that we've all come to realize are our mainstays of the food web in a lot of ways. Phototrophic picoplankton, some of them very simple, either rod or coxy in their shape, but there is also bacteria that are flagellated, some that are not. And it's a surprisingly diverse assemblage, even for cells that are relatively small in size. Um, phototrophic nanoplankton, um, particularly in Lake Erie, there are periodic blooms of diatoms that come and go, wax and wane throughout the year. They're not as maybe defined as they are in some of the upper Great Lakes where they're more seasonal. Um, these can occur throughout the parts of the spring, the summer, and even into the later part of the stratification period. And what's become quite prevalent um, in the Great Lakes are these small centric diatoms that seem to be quite persistent in their growth. And, and um, they are what I would say are um, persistent features of the of the assemblage throughout the year, which is quite amazing. Some of this did not really, wasn't quite as obvious until after the mussels were on the scene. Heterotrophic nano and microplankton, uh, these uh, micrographs are a close up view of some of the flagellated protists and ciliated protists that are common in the Great Lakes and in Lake Erie in particular. We can even see kind of wrapped up into the ciliature around the mouth of this uh, Pelagiostrombidium, some centric diatoms, so we kind of get a view of what they may like to eat. So there's certainly a complex trophic dynamic that happens even within that 200 microns and down. Um, Protoboda, uh, Paraboda, uh, cannibal ferris, some of these are what people don't really know what these things do out there. We have some notions about it, but there's very little direct evidence that ties many of these organisms to their food. So in terms of methodology, we ran experiments uh, from water and mussels that were collected in the Western Basin. Um, this work right here is the, depicted here to the left is work by Ashley Elgin at NOAA. And it basically shows that the mussel assemblage in, in that part of the Great Lakes is pretty much dominated by quaggas and that they can reach reasonably high densities, some of them uh, in excess of four or, or uh, 800 or 1,000 grams per square meter, which is uh, quite large. So um, this panel are, is some work based on um, research by Vincent Deneff and his group that shows the diversity of cyanobacteria and how it progresses throughout the course of the growing season from May uh, fairly soon from now, all the way through October. And it's a, comp it's, a, it's a bit more of a mix than just microcystis, for instance. And a number of these things are potentially harmful as well. So what we wanted to do was to sample throughout this period. And you'll see that there's data that was, uh, or experiments that were done in May, June, July, August, September, 
We have five experiments that we're going to report on today that I'll, I'll talk about, but 10 experiments in all were done. Water was collected uh, lar uh, primarily for the experiments that I did at WLE2. Muscles were collected at uh, WLE4. And you can see the density of muscles out there was, was larger. So we did take muscles from a different site that the water was collected. And the experiments that were done were really quite simple in concept. Um, we were looking at the presence and absence of quaggas and how it affected that lower food web. How we got to this point though is maybe not so simple. Um, large volumes of water were collected in excess of 200 liters of water and it was allowed to acclimate as well as muscles. And we went through a series of stages, one of acclimation, two, two steps of acclimation. And then ultimately we divided up um, the muscles into buckets. You can see uh, Paul Gleichel and Glenn Carter uh, um, helping with this experiment. Um, and we used fresh water and muscles that had acclimated for um, at least 24 hours. The, the, the muscles themselves were cleaned as well prior to doing any experiments. And um, this, the experiments were actually incubated in a walk-in um, incubator that has temperature and light day length control. The experimental design again was, was a simple one, but I think a good one. And, and it certainly is, an al is allowing us to get some insights, hopefully into, into the dynamics that happen in this lower food web. We had control and muscle treatments, presence, absence, treated identically and um, mesocosms filled randomly. We sized the muscles and put them into um, a, uh, a small container or really just a small um, uh, corral that they uh, that that were they allowed to attach and then maintain themselves uh, for the course of the experiments. These experiments did not go very long. Three to four hours was really all that we could actually do because in many cases, most cases, they depleted plankton from the water that quickly. We had um, initials that were taken from each of the mesocosms and then finals. So a total of 14 samples were collected over the course of the experiment. And by the, the time that we analyzed all the samples, we had what we could identify as 90 different taxa in that plankton assemblage. So our matrix of samples for any one experiment was 14 samples from the mesocosms against 90 different prey taxa, potential prey taxa. The counting that we do um, is something that we've developed over time and we have samples that we process for pico and nanoplankton as well as microplankton, and then ciliates are counted separate. So each sample is analyzed using four different preparations. Um, we standardize the effort for each sample and we analyze depending on the complexity of the sample and whether there's colonial, um, blooms of, of, of cyanobacteria, which complicate things a bit, um, we tend to count somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 cells from every sample. And you can see that there's a range of magnifications and preps that we use for each one of these uh, subsamples, if you will. So once we've counted the samples, um, from the treatments. We sized the taxa uh, nearly 
every one of the taxa that we've encountered gets sized and gets sized numerous times using an imaging system. And we can convert the abundance that we calculate into cellular carbon uh, for each taxon. We analyze some of these data using some multivariate techniques, which I'm gonna talk about, which they're not complete. So it's gonna be more of a work in progress using primer um, software, and then more typical analyses that we did and we've published, we're in the process of publishing on this, where we looked at the clearance rates on different taxonomic and size categories um, and using uh, an analyses with R and standard um, statistical packages like that. Most of the data I'm gonna show you are either abundance data of the prey and their changes among the, um, oops, uh, changes among the treatments or their clearance rates that were calculated using this equation where we had to know the mass of the muscles, the number of time or the amount of time that the muscles were um, actually uh, consuming, and then the mass in the control versus the quagga treatments and taking the log of that. So these are standard um, uh, clearance rates for the muscles themselves. And you can see uh, what the different elements of that calculation are the volume of the experimental carboy or the, or the mesocosm, the mass of the muscles, the incubation time, and then the mass of the plankton for any, any one group we were interested in is what gets keyed into that final um, calculation, part of the calculation. We had an opportunity here because we had a lot of people involved in some different instruments to try to find out how coherent some of our measurements were and cohesive to you know to one another. So I'm going to go through a couple of different calibrations that we did. The first one was using flow cytometry. We have a Beckman Coulter uh, cytoflex. You can see some of the particulars about it. Um, we didn't rely that heavily on this for the this set of experiments, but we're going to be doing some subsequently, most of the picoplankton we counted um, under the microscope using the method I, I just described above. Um, but we are capable of using um, flow cytometry to do this and to do it in a reasonable way. Um, and we're able to put the pico, the phototrophic picoplankton into groups and quantify them binning uh, by color and by yields um, and side scatter to put these into either PE, -E, phycoerythrin, or phycocyanin rich, and whether they're single cells versus colonial type cells or cells that form simple chains. And all this is calibrated with beads in that kind of same size range. So it's worked reasonably well. We've also done some counts of beads and direct counting of, um, so beads versus flow cytometry, and we get very good relationships with that standard curves, if you will. And we've also used flow cytometry to, es to estimate the abundance of plankton in a variety of lakes. And that's what that correlation um, refers to there. Uh, it's reasonable. Um, it's certainly not as coherent as that standard curve, but they're usable data and they're, they're reasonable proxies is what we, what we believe. The next calibration that was done was with either extracted chlorophyll from the actual mesocosms and comparing that to our counts. When we did that for every sample that was collected, we had, uh, 70 samples in all, we get fairly strong relationships between the phototrophic component of that micro food web and the, chlor the extracted chlorophyll that was um, filtered in, and processed from each of the mesocosms. So when we compare our cell cellular carbon to, to chlorophyll, not only do we get good regressions, but we get 
carbon to chlorophyll ratios for that phototrophic fraction that makes sense. They range anywhere from 15 to 30, which are all uh, reasonable uh, relationships. We also summarize the F uh, values. These, uh, these are the actual clearance rates, not statistical F values, but actual clearance rates using microscopy and for extracted chlorophyll. And you'll see we get a reasonable relationship we might actually have two groups of data here, but um, it is uh, a reasonable R value um, that is significant, but um, uh, certainly there is some, uh, uh, some other things happening here that um, probably complicate that relationship. There's a lot of error built into the actual calculation of, of the clearance rates. So, that may explain why that correspondence is a little lower than just the raw values in that box and the R squared associated with that below. We also did flow cam. I, did, I don't think I have any relationships between that and microscopy, but we do have one other set. We used an instrument called a fluoroprobe. Um, this can measure um, it um, uses uh, an excitation series to actually determine different pigment composition of plankton in situ, and then derive using certain equations, your percent and the concentration of blue greens, cyanobacteria, diatoms, and greens. We were able to summarize our microscopy data into those same categories and then run correlations between the flora probe data and ours, and we got reasonable relationships, um, still a lot of variation between the two, but but it's a, it's at least a significant relationship with a trend in the right direction. And again, those are for clearance rates, which have um, compounded variation in them. So uh, it's kind of a worst case scenario. So in terms of results, I'm going to talk a little bit just about some of the traditional things that we looked at. And overall, we found that dracenid mussels across the five experiments that I collected data for and, and uh, summarized data for, they were active grazers on all the dates. There's a simple bar graph with error bars there, um, standard errors. Um, and you can see the standard error among our treatments was reasonably low uh, and um, um, repeatable. And we had clearance rates that were between five and 10 on most states. And then that date in July, they exceeded 20. That's in milliliters per milligram quagga per hour. The total range among any of the mesocosms was somewhere around one and a half to 25 with a mean of close to 12. So clearance rates, um, uh, certainly quite measurable clearance rates on all in all the experiments. Hmm. These data um, basically plot the abundance in cells per ml for each one of the mesocosms and these are all the data in a raw form, really. So we're looking at the dark bars, which are the initials for every mesocosm. And the open white bars are the finals. And so, for instance, in May, we have picoplankton that was counted nano microplankton. We're not differentiating between phototrophic or heterotrophic. They're just totals. Um, you'll see that Picoplankton, for instance, the abundance across all the treatments for the initials was quite um, uh, repeatable. Same for nanoplankton, same for microplankton, which is what we'd expect. But the difference between the controls and the quagga treatments uh, became even more dramatic as we increased the size of the prey. They, um, they were certainly grazing 
considerable, the difference between the open and dark bars for nanoplankton and for microplankton were considerable. And these types of results were repeated throughout the year. We didn't get so much measurable grazing on small cells. We got some for larger cells, but the sweet spot seems to be in the middle for the nanoplankton. So that's for the May, June, and July experiments. This last set of panels or for the last two experiments that were done in August and October. Um, and you can see a little bit more variable here as the uh, growing season went on. And the results may be not quite as clear, but still some reasonable differences in grazing between the initials and the finals. And this was also true of the microplankton a little bit more mixed results for picos. So mussels were capable of grazing on all the plankton in all the size categories. We got consistent results among the treatments. And um, when we converted these to actual clearance rates, we found that the clearance rates, there's a summary table down there to the right, were the highest for the nanoplankton uh, compared uh -huh. to picoplankton and microplankton. Is there a question? Oh, okay. And these are just a summary for clearance rates by Dracaena among the different phototrophic and heterotrophic groups. So we had diatoms, green, cryptophytes, cyanobacteria, and Probably what I'd say is just looking at the average values, the mussels clearly had high clearance rates for cryptophytes, diatoms next, lower for greens, considerably lower, a fraction of what it was for the other groups. And then interestingly enough, on average, negative clearance rates for cyanobacteria, which means that they're not clearing them. They're actually increasing in number through the course of the experiment. If we look at the heterotrophic group, we've got chrysomonads, prosinophytes, dinoflagellates, and ciliates. We see again, there's great range on each of these groups individually. But when we start to look at average values, we see that there are some preferred prey. Uh, the prosinophytes include things like um, chrysochromulina, um, and those prosinophytes um, are mainly modal. Um, chrysophytes also high clearance rates, less so for these other two groups. One might argue, and what's been done in the past or shown in the past, these two groups are far more modal than these two groups in terms of perhaps having a mechanism by which they can escape uh, being preyed upon. When we actually look at grazing among plankton size categories and using ANOVAs that have been blocked by date for these different groups, size categories, we find that there are some significant differences um, nearly all of the ANOVAs we ran were significant or at least close to being significantly different among uh, the different size categories. And in most cases, it was the picoplankton that were less preferred. Um, we didn't have a picoplankton group for the heterotrophs, but it was somewhere between nanoplankton and microplankton that were uh, most preferred by the mussels and nanoplankton on most dates. For the heterotrophs, um, a similar sort of pattern was observed where the nanoplankton-sized heterotrophs were the most preferred by mussels. A couple of examples. Um, when we plot these through time, um, looking at the clearance rates by date for the five experiments and 
the error bars there depicted are, I believe they're standard errors. So some of these are, are reasonably large. Um, but what we see is that these, all three of these groups are quite susceptible to muscle grazing. Um, values of five and above are considerable grazing rates, um, uh, clearance rates by the by the muscles themselves, and all of these are in excess of that uh, for each of the three groups listed here. So these seem to be the mainstay, if you will, for food that um, might sustain populations of the the quagga mussels. Picking out the, some of the other groups that may have been resistant to grazing by quaggas for a whole variety of, of reasons, and many of the reasons we don't know, or at least I don't know. Um, chlorophytes, you can see that the grazing rates uh, or the clearance rates um, by mussels on chlorophytes were low for most of, for three out of the five dates. Um, higher for uh, these other two dates in one, one in July and October. When we get a negative value, it actually means that that prey item is, that group of prey is actually growing in the quagga treatments. For um, dinoflagellates, on two dates, um, they the clearance rates were um, not distinguishable from zero. In June, they were actually quite negative. And then in two dates, uh, July and August, uh, there was considerable clearance rates. And this might be due to the fact that um, we had a species shift uh, to a summer assemblage that was dominated by gymnodinium varians, which seems to be cleared. Again, it's a smaller uh, species and um, it probably was cleared, it appears to be cleared at a higher rate. Cyanobacteria was a complex of both microcystis for the most part, um, pseudoanabina, planktothrix, those were three of the big ones. Um, and as you can see early in the year, there was actually negative clearance rates, meaning they grew in the mesocosms. Later in the year, they were either low clearance rates or that one in July is actually quite considerable. And we need to drill down and actually look at the taxon specific dynamics that are going on within any one of these groups. I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end, but we're still in process trying to sort that out. So if we do a, a block de Nova on the taxonomic groupings of prey, we find that uh, for phototrophs, May through October, it's diatoms and cryptophytes, which seem to be the most preferred. Um, and they're either uh, at the top of the list or secondary. And what seems to be the least can, uh, preferred are cyanobacteria and green algae. On the heterotrophic side of things, again, it's this persinophytes and dinofl smaller dinoflagellates that seem to be preferred prey uh, in these last two groups. And then larger dinoflagellates on three dates and ciliates that um, seem to be uh, at least somewhat resistant to muscle grazing. The last thing I want to talk about are drilling down where we can, and we've got one experiment where I've, I've actually analyzed data, and that's what I'm going to present today, but to actually look at on a taxon specific basis what's happening among the treatments. Uh, and so we're going to use an experiment from May. And we started off doing a cluster, a hierarchical cluster and doing a SIMPROF test, which, looks, which, which actually tests for similarity uh, and tries to find groups among the, um, uh, the treatments that are, are, uh, that are um, exposed to the cluster. 
Um, we end up using a Bray-Curtis similarity matrix to do this, and I removed zeros from the data set. So you remember I said there were 90 taxa. Well, on any one date, um, two thirds of those may be zeros. So um, the matrix that in May, which was probably the, the least specious, um, consisted of the 14 samples from the mesocosms by 35 variables, which were the taxa that were we counted as prey. If you look at this cluster analysis, it's ordered quite the way we might have anticipated. Um, we have all four quagga treatments, the finals, grouping separately from all the rest of the other 10 treatments, which are a mix of uh, control and quagga initials, and then control finals. So these form a separate group from these, and it's significant uh, in terms of a statistical um, a probabilistic statement we can make about that. What's nice is we can use this grouping now to do some other analyses. And this is based again on the 14 by 35 matrix. If we do a, a non-metric MDS, again, using the same matrix, we find that the groupings are, again, quite distinct in, in, in space here, and that the treatments, uh, A being that um, quagga final group of four, uh, four mesocosms, is quite separate from the uh, the other 10 treatments, uh, 10 mesocosms. And um, those uh, um, polygons, if you will, that have been drawn around that are statistically significantly uh, different from one another. So we do have two very distinct uh, groups of mesocosms based on the, uh, uh, the assemblage that um, that's represented within the prey assemblage. What's driving the difference between these four mesocosms and the others? Um, what I've done here is to do a simpler uh, test, which looks at the contribution of the actual species or the taxa that are driving the differences between these two groupings that were identified with the cluster analysis. And you can do a one-way, an analog of a one-way analysis of variance based on these uh, matrices. So what we found was that there was indeed a significant difference looking at the species composition and what's driving it tends to be a mix of both phototrophic and heterotrophic nanoplankton. So, um, and these are color coded. A is a uh, chromulina uh, minima over here that's listed here. We have an average similarity and then a cumulative variance, uh, cumulative percent of what uh, this uh, composition of that quagga final is actually made up of. So it's quite interesting. We also have chrysochromulina parva, um, discostella, Stelidra, a diatom, nanochloris, a species that we have yet to really identify, uh, Parabodo, um, Rhodomonas minuto, which is a cryptophyte. And um, so that's the complement of taxa that seems to be differentiating between the groups. So not only are these things consumed um, at a high rate by, by the muscles, but it's differentiating those treatments from the controls, if you will. And this last test um, just is reaffirming what we think we know is that these quagga final treatments really, um, if we uh, look at a number of permutations uh, and compare those to chance, um, these are very distinctly different groups.
and they seem to be driven by that subset of taxa that are uh, consumed at a high rate by the muscles themselves. So to, to kind of draw some conclusions here, muscles, these dracenid muscles are active grazers uh, on all three categories of plankton. And they're grazing not only on heterotrophs, but on phototrophs. And what that means, the implications for that in terms of the dynamics within that, uh, that assemblage is to me is, is currently unknown. But um, it's also safe to say they had the highest clearance rates on um, cells that are in that nanoplankton size range, which is, has been reported on before. So this seems to go with, coincide with what other folks have found. Uh, the cryptophytes were really grazed at high rates. Uh, that's Rhodomonas minuta and even Cryptomonas erosa on some dates. Diatoms also cleared, particularly that uh, Discostella, uh, the small centric, and um, those small centric seem to be an important component of the plankton anymore. Chrysochromia lina also preferred. Interestingly enough, there were plankton groups that were inconsistently grazed by the quaggas. They either had negative clearance rates or very low clearance rates. And these included chlorophytes, uh, what was formerly known as uh, uh, Cynodesmus um, and Pediastrum, larger colonial greens. Um, that were not um, effectively grazed. Other people have reported on this, and this colony formation may form um, geometries that are difficult for the um, muscles to consume. They also have um, some mucilage that may form uh, a protective coating. They may also produce some aleopathic reactions too. There were highly modal protists like Eurotrica, uh, Gymnodinium, larger forms of Gymnodinium, and even some, um, some other ciliates that might have strong enough swimming strength to avoid being consumed by muscles. Cyanobacteria also lower negative clearance rates. And this um, may be a form of a physical phenomenon by the orientation and the geometry of those colonies, as well as possible aleopathic reactions. So our data suggests in the end that quaggas ex exercise uh, some form of selectivity in how they feed and their behavior around that, and that it seems at least to, uh, a teaser to me that the differential grazing certainly goes, could reinforce uh, the, blo the blooming of some of these um, potentially harmful species and certainly might shape how uh, plankton uh, go through succession in a seasonal fashion uh, in that lake. I will stop there. Wonderful, Hunter. Thank you very much. Super, super interesting. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or drop it in the chat and um, we'll get that question to Hunter. Some some hand virtual hand clapping coming in. Um, uh, Hunter, I, I just wanted to ask you a quick question. Did you notice um, at the beginning of the, the grazing experiments um, whether or not there were um, chain forming olicosiras and needle like fragilarioids in the community as well. And there are. And um, Asterionella is another one. Um, yes, there were. And, and, and oh, sorry. Ahead. Oh, I was going to ask if there was any impact to those at all, or if it truly is just, you know, focusing on these, you know, under 10 micron uh, centrics. No, I think they were grazed um, with some with some efficiency, but probably not the same efficiency. And it's interesting that you bring that up, um, David, because we've actually seen in different parts of the lake where uh, some of these um, Sinedra-like uh, long 
uh, A-raphid diatoms have pro proliferated in addition to the, the centric. So I think you're on to something there. Awesome. Thanks to, thanks to hear that. Um, oh, I, questions are piling up. Sorry. Um, okay. uh, I don't know who is first between Gina and Mark, but uh, Gina, you go first. Hello, Gina. She's unmuted, but we don't hear her. All right, I'll give you a second, Gina. Uh, Mark, go ahead. There we go. I, hey, Hunter, cool talk. Um, just a quick question. I, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to picture this whole experimental setup. These five gallon buckets from Ace Hardware. Um, That's right. How when you talk about putting muscles in them. Can you give me some sense of, I, I don't know, you know, how many milligrams of muscles are in, you know, uh, can you give me a sense of how many muscles were in one bucket and yep. as part of this about, treatment? Yeah, I can. Uh, about 20. About 20 muscles. Yeah. And so they're in a tray mm -hmm. and they get placed in the, um, in the bucket itself. Um, and what we do is we, with the fluoroprobe, we can make measurements every half hour or so. Mm -hmm. And so once we look, once we get down to a clearance rate, once we get to a removal of about 30 or 40% of the plankton, we, we terminate the experiment. Okay. And that's happening within hours, you said, right? <laughs> wow. Amazing. Yeah. It's uh, um, unbelievable. Okay. One, one other quick question. I'm, I'm, uh, can you give, I, I was um, impressed and intrigued by the um, four different analytical uh, steps you were doing in looking at these before and after samples. And um, I'm just curious how you, what, any, uh, can you give us some, just a little bit of insight into how you merge those types of samples together? I mean, all I'm thinking of is when I look at the diatom, <laughs> I'm thinking, the diatoms fall into nano and micro. They and, do. They and, do. And, and how are you? <clears throat> maybe how? This are you is where the rubber meets the road, Mark. <clears throat> yeah. How how do you? So there's how do you a differentiate there's a, those two methods and then combine them. So maybe that's what yeah. I want. So um, there's a beauty to this, and uh, um, certainly a nagging um, reality to it, um, because of course things don't fall into neat categories, as we all know, um, for a whole bunch of reasons. But the 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 overlap gives us some redundancy, which mm. is a good thing. Um, we can verify some of our counting that way. But generally, what we do is we, let's say we're counting Cryptomonas ovata, and we count it with the micro method and the nano method, Wherever we have a larger sample size, that's what we tend to go with. Oh, okay. And we would okay. ignore um, the lower sample size from that one count so that there's no inflation of, of its values. Okay, cool. Thank you. But it, it definitely is, it takes some, um, it's like putting uh, different decks of cards together. Yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks, Hunter. Yep. All right. Uh, Mike, Paul, I see you have your hand up. I'm just going to ask Gina's question really quickly. She said she's having some technical issues. Um, Gina wants to know if uh, you looked at pseudo feces, were you able to look uh, to run the experiments long enough for pseudo feces to develop? It's a very good question. And um, if Hank was here, I'm sure he'd answer it a lot better than I'm going to. But um, Yes, pseudofeces was produced. Um, it was um, because the experiments were so attenuated, they're short. Um, what we found was that it did not seem to affect uh, the nutrient concentrations in the treatments and excretion rates were also measured. And nutrients in the pseudofeces were measured after the fact. So some of that was collected and um, and in turn measured, um, but that wasn't. Uh, that's probably about as much as I could talk about it. 
um, intelligently, I suppose. Thanks, Hunter. Um, yeah. Mike, you've had your hand up for a long time. I'm sure it's getting tired over there. Feel free to pop in and ask. Well, damn that, Gina LaLiberté, for asking the same question I was going to ask, but I will spin it. Um, uh, I had the same question about pseudospecies, and, and I think maybe what Gina wanted to know, or certainly what I want to know, is like whether the composition of the pseudospecies uh, in terms of the cells, like looking for would be an indication of what they might have grazed but didn't consume. Um, and so were you looking at the pseudophysis to see if like, okay, they're clearing chlorophytes, but they're not eating them, they're not digesting them, or they're clearing cyanobacteria? That's a great question. question was, what is the mechanism for selective feeding? Because I think of, and I had to pull out my Barnes invertebrate zoology textbook to look this up what you were talking about, but I think of mussels as sort of indiscriminate filters, not like a, not like a cladostrin that will handle a particle and then, you know, toss it away, but they tend to filter everything and things they don't want, they eject the pseudofeces and things they do want, they'll digest and, and turn, turn to feces. So what would, like the mechanism of, of allelopathy, you would think would, would affect all the, it would just sort of shut down filtration, not sort of trigger selection. So I'm just wondering about that mechanism and then what the composition of the pseudofeces was. Yeah, the composition of the pseudofeces was hard to determine. Um, so I, I, I did not look at any of it myself, but Hank did. Um, and it was difficult to determine anything that we could, you know, identify. Um, as far as shutting down um, filtration, I, I think muscles might be able to expel uh, cells before they would actually take them in too. I think they have a mechanism by which they can do that. So they may not just be simple machines that take stuff in and either um, consume it or expel it through uh, the gut. Thanks, Connor. Great you bet. That, that was a, uh, those are good questions. Very good questions. All right, uh, Mark, your hand's going up, but just hold on a second. I have a question in the chat from Oreo Helix Ecological. I had to look up what Oreo Helix okay. uh, <laughs> a, I guess a snail gene. Where, where are they? Yeah, I don't. Um, the Oreo Helix's question is, are there uh, native bivalves in Lake Erie? Yes, there are. Um, my colleagues here, I'm working with um, Daylin Woolnow, uh, Dave Zanata, and they uh, work on unionids. And there are, um, there is, you know, uh, a fairly diverse assemblage of native unionids, some of which have suffered um, with in different parts of the Great Lakes with, uh, in, uh, you know, establishments of some of these invasives. But yes, there are. I couldn't speak too intelligently about what those are, but uh, but they certainly could. And um, I can provide their uh, contact information if you want. No, oh, thanks, Hunter. Um, Mark, you put your hand down. Yeah, I, I, I was clicking. I was going to say something, and I already lowered it. But I can, I can still ask my question. Oh no, I'm going to jump. Go ahead. All right, that's fine. Um, this, Hunter, can you just? Um, everyone poops, but can you tell me what fake poops are? What pseudo feces are in relation to these muscles? I what. What I understand about it is that they have a, a way of expelling waste um, before it's actually gone through their the the whole uh, an, an entire digestive process. Is it so? It's is almost it? kind of like um, this may sound funny, but like owls can they okay. they can it comes, regurgitate uh, it comes, pellets it comes out this way <laughs> through the <laughs> yeah, through the intake. Got it. Got it. <laughs> um, just uh. Just uh, curious, I, I've seen plenty of quaggas at the bottom of the lake and dredged them up and done all that kind of stuff. Do they, when they, when you get them outside the lake and sitting in trays, do they put down bissel threads like zebra mussels do? They do. They, they do. do. Okay. okay. And so what Hank is kind of the mastermind between, uh, behind these experiments. And he's been doing this for a while now. And what he has 
figured out is that um, that pre-treatment, that acclimation period is really important to, to provide them with enough food and to not disturb their, or at least to, to, try, to try to provide an, a, an environment that's at least close to ambient so that mm -hmm. they can resume their, their uh, natural behavior. Okay. Okay. Good. Thanks. Yep. Sarah, go ahead. Um, thanks, Hunter. This is really fascinating. I have so many questions that I'm going to be <laughs> following up via email with you. Oh, good. Good. Um, and uh, what you know, sort of the 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 big obvious question is, I mean, you're showing how much this can favor cyanobacterial growth. And so um, what is, I mean, do you have an idea of how the amount of blooms that are favored by the very fact of having these Dracinid mussels present? Yeah, um, that is a really great question. <laughs> And uh, I think it it's it gets into the the calculations that we really all um, need to do and think about. And so um, I didn't show this, but Casey Godwin um, and uh, Glenn Carter they published a paper along with this paper that that I worked on looking at what portion of the water column is actually cleared. And then with estimates like this, if we have a notion about what selectivity there is or lack thereof, we should be able to calculate from there. And, and they did what the, how that might affect the growth rate of microcystis, for instance. Mm -hmm. And even, I mean, it's probably getting harder <laughs> within a given region to have invaded versus non-invaded lakes yeah. to look at those those differences in um, cyanobacterial blooms. Yeah, and it really gets complicated. The, the way he did this, he did this, uh, Casey, that is, he modeled this in kind of a stepwise fashion because you have animals that are kind of ad pressed to the bottom that are filtering things, material that's coming down to them in one way, shape, or form. You've got a mixing regime in the water column, and it it gets complicated really fast. Mm -hmm. And then a light regime, of course, that's that's not homogeneous. Well, great, thanks so much, and yep. you'll be getting some messages from me. Okay. <laughs> All right, we can sneak in one more question here before we uh, want to respectfully let everybody go. Tom, go ahead. Hi, Hunter. A great presentation. And I also want to thank you for helping me with cryptophytes in the past. Um, I, I had a, um, a, a question about, you know, what happens when you transfer from the mesocosms over to the real world in the lake? And I um, I suspect that the, the, the separation or the distinction between different types of plankton would even be greater uh, in the lake because, you know, microcystis and a bunch of those uh, cyanos had aerotopes. So they'd be physically separated. They'd be at the surface. And obviously your, your filter feeders would be at the bottom, you know, except of course, when you got some mixing, but um, yeah. That, that's a really good point. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's something that could exacerbate this tremendously. Because the other thing that's fascinating to me, if what you're saying is true, and, and we know it, it is to some degree, right? If what you're yeah. saying is true, you're eliminating competitors. So the muscles are actually eliminating competitors to the cyanobacteria by eating the so-called uh, good guys and girls, right? That they're, they're they're straining out what's high quality food, um, and leaving behind more nutrients. One might predict on a per capita basis uh, for the for the bloom forming species, and that's the part that mathematically yes. I'm going to have to work with somebody that 
can parameterize uh, that that sort of a dynamic. Uh, Mark Rowe at, at NOAA's really a, a great candidate for that for that kind of a uh, calculation. So I, I'd be interested, you know, if, if some of the picocyanos were actually uh, decreased uh, while while others were unaffected. So so you know some of the stuff that was non-chain forming and also do, do not have aerotopes. Yeah, and and another good question. Um, what's interesting to me, um, and again, we're we're so biased by where we're sampling. It's fairly near shore. It's at the mouth of the Maumee, so it, in a sense, is almost a worst case scenario to some degree. And um, picoplankton are, even though they're abundant, they don't make up near the percentage of uh, biomass as they do in other parts of the Great Lakes. Um, but um, I was surprised that they were grazed. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you bet.